wonderful to be here today. I rejoice with you because you are in this special service. And I pray that the Lord will open our eyes to the scriptures, to the word in Jesus' name. Amen. And the truth of his word, even though it's the common subject that we think we know, water baptism. I pray that the significance and the depth of the revelation of the word of God will come in every heart today in Jesus' name. Amen. And the effect and the blessing and the benefits of that baptism will be in your life, Amen. in my life, Amen. in our lives together, Amen. and in the church in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this day. We bless your name for your word. It's ever fresh, it's ever new, it's ever deep, it's ever, ever high. And we're asking, oh Lord, your own intention in giving us this ordinance of the water baptism will be realized and fulfilled in every life today in Jesus' name. Help us to understand what you have revealed in your word coming from your spirit and you have recorded everything for us and preserved in the Holy Bible. I will pray, Lord, the word will work mightily in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. We're looking at Matthew chapter 28. And I'm reading from verse 18 all through to verse 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And the church said, you see what Jesus said in verse 19. Go ye therefore, therefore because all power belongs to me. Therefore because all authority belongs to me. Therefore because the power of heaven resides in me. And then in that power, in that authority and strength, I send you forth. And I say go ye therefore, teach all nations is telling us that no nation should miss the teaching of the fact that Jesus is Savior, that Jesus only is Savior, that Jesus always is Savior, that Jesus ever is Savior in every tribe, in every community, in every nation, everywhere in the world teaching them. And it says, when they believe that Jesus is their personal savior, and there is no competition, no rival with Jesus in their lives, and they take him as the only savior, without any of the traditions of their past, and without any of the gods in their past, in their country, then you baptize them, baptizo you dip them inside water you immerse them inside water it's symbolic it's practical it's purposeful that you bury them inside the water bring them back again as you bury them you do this on my authority actually the disciples knew the apostles knew from this time Anything they did, they were to do in the name of the Lord. Were they eating in the name of the Lord? Were they drinking in the name of the Lord? Were they marrying in the name of the Lord? 
when they walk in in the name of the Lord whatsoever ye do you do all in the name in the authority of the Lord and when you baptize you go to baptize in the name of the Lord in the authority of the Lord because this is what he has said to you but in the real baptism when you dip them inside the water inside the river in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost after you have finished that water baptism you'll not say bye-bye we'll meet at the gate of heaven you bring them near and you're now teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you always always even to the end of the world he's telling us when he says even to the end of the world everything that started then everything they began then they'll begin they'll continue until the end of the age so teaching all nations until the end of the world preaching the gospel until the end of the world baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy Ghost until the end of the world and then teaching them after that water baptism you keep on teaching them all things whatsoever i have commanded you until the end of the world mark chapter 16. we're reading from verse 15 mark chapter 16 verse 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and don't leave any tribe out of the world don't leave any community out of the world don't leave any person anywhere young and old don't leave any person out and he says and preach the gospel to every creature whatever their language whatever their state religion whatever their background and whatever they had made covenant ways or covenant in even for the children of israel that's part of the world you will teach them and preach to them the gospel the gospel of grace the gospel of salvation the gospel of the kingdom the gospel of christ the gospel of god the gospel of peace the gospel that comes to change and transform their lives you preach that to every creature he that believes and is baptized he that believeth that i jesus am the son of god he that believeth that i jesus i am the only savior he that believeth that i jesus am the lamb of god made and given for the salvation of the whole world he that believeth not just believed or will believe he that believeth that this jesus he died he rose he was buried he rose again by the power of god and the power of the spirit of god when they are firm that believe they'll be baptized they shall be saved he that believeth not even if a bishop baptizes him he that believeth not even if the foremost apostle baptizes him he that believeth not even if he goes back to jordan to be baptized the baptism means nothing if he does not believe he that believeth not shall be damned and now how significant was this baptism to start with all those who were baptized before jesus died was buried rose again and went to heaven all those who were baptized on a partial understanding of a partial limited gospel when they now heard the gospel that jesus christ has died he was buried he rose again and he went to heaven as they believe the gospel of the new testament 
they are now baptized even if they were baptized before that's how significant this baptism is come to acts chapter 19 and i'm reading from verse 1 and it came to pass that while apollos was at corinth paul having passed through the upper coast came to ephesus and finding certain disciples Search unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Holy Ghost, that name, we have not heard. And then he asked them, he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. You see, John's baptism came before the death of Jesus. And when they went to John to be baptized, he said, God sent me to baptize. So he will take them and put them inside water in the name of God, God Almighty. Did he hear about the Holy Ghost in the formula of baptism, in John's baptism? That's why they said, we have never heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And there are people that say they baptize in the name of Jesus only. If a baptizing in the name of Jesus means in the name of Jesus only, how would they have heard about the Holy Ghost? But when they said, we have not heard whether there be any Holy Ghost, they said, what? Are you not baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? If you were baptized correctly, you would have heard of the Holy Ghost. Oh, they said, it was John's baptism. Look at verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him that should come. Future. Should believe on him that should come. They need to understand about the death and burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He only told them, He is coming. Believe on Him that shall come after Him, that He is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the authority, by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And now they have the chance of hearing there is Holy Ghost. Now, not only that. If you are saved, truly saved, you're sanctified, truly sanctified, you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you'll not say, see, I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm infilled by the Holy Ghost. I'm immersed into the Holy Ghost. And so water is nothing in comparison with the Holy Ghost. And so I don't need water baptism. Yes, you do. Water baptism is so important and is so essential that even if you, have been, if you have been saved and sanctified and filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost, if you have not been baptized in water, you still have to be baptized in water. Acts of the Apostles chapter 10. I read from verse 44. Acts chapter 10 verse 44. While Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that had the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then said Peter, look at this, look at this one. Can any man forbid water? Why should they be baptized in water again? 
They are saved, sanctified, made holy, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they have got something so great that came from heaven all the same. Water baptism is so important that even after they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, Peter said, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord because of the authority of the Lord. Then prayed him to tarry certain days. As we look at the word today, I'm talking to you on the blessing and the benefits of the believer's baptism. The blessing and the benefits of the believer's baptism. First of all, why were they to be baptized in water? Why were you, why was I baptized in water? Point number one, bearing the dead old man at the baptism. Burying the dead old man at the baptism. You see, baptism identifies us with Christ. We add the old man. And as Christ was crucified, our old man is crucified with him. And as Christ died, after the crucifixion, our old man died. And as Jesus was buried after his death, we need to take the old man, the dead old man, for burial. And as Jesus rose from the dead, the old man that was buried has to rise and become a new man. And as Jesus ascended to heaven and is seated on the throne of God after his resurrection, we are raised up to sit together with him on his throne. The significance, the meaning, the symbolism, of that baptism is a burial with Christ. Point number one, burying the dead old man at the baptism. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, I read from verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus were baptized into his death. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. We are buried with him. You cannot bury somebody if he's still alive. He has to die. And after that death, you cannot leave him there. Before the people, exposed to the people. After that death, there has to be a burial. That's why it says, therefore we, we are baptized in water, were buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Before that death, there was a crucifixion. Let's come to Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. One, the crucifixion. Crucifixion. Galatians chapter 5, reading from verse 19. It's telling us now about the characteristics of the nature of the old man as the old man is still alive is referred to as the works of the flesh 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Wherefore, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. In verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these old man, manifestation, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, copycats, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, MVEs, look at the old man, the actions, the activities of the old man, witchcraft, drunkenness, rebellions, such like and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What do we do to the old man then? What do we do to those manifestations of the old man? Verse 24, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. All those works of the flesh. There's crucifixion that takes place for us. They've crucified them with the affections and the lusts. Galatians chapter 6, reading from verse 14. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. The world, what makes up the world, whether it's worldliness, whether it's defilement, whether it's corruption, whether it's bribes, with every seed that goes to the, where the world is crucified unto me. I look at the world crucified unto me, and the one looks at me, I'm crucified unto the world. Galatians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. You cannot begin to talk about baptism without the death of the old man. The old man is crucified. And that crucified old man is put to death. And then after that, you take that dead old man for burial. That's the baptism. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. One, you are crucified with Christ. Two, you are dead with Christ. To be unfortunate to find a person who oh, has not really died, is still alive, alive to fornication, alive to adultery, alive to stealing, alive to the world, alive in all the works of the flesh, and take that man that has not died and go and bury him. What a tragedy. Crucified, then dead. Come back to Romans. I'm reading from Romans chapter 6, and I read from verse 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that an old man is crucified, was he? Our old man is crucified, was he? That the body of sin might be destroyed, the purpose, the goal, the outcome and the eventual final scene is that that old man, the body of sin, henceforth might be destroyed and henceforth we will not serve sin. You'll not be a servant of sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is free from sin. This is not talking about Christ. He had no sin, but he, talking about you, talking about me, crucified and dead is freed from sin 
now if we be dead if we be dead with Christ we believe that we shall also live with him in verse 9 knowing that Christ be raised from the dead there is no more death has no more dominion over him for in that he died he died unto sin once and in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Look at this, look at this, verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're dead with him. It's now after that death we are buried with Christ Romans chapter 6 reading from verse 3 Romans chapter 6 verse 3 know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should live in newness of life. We are dipped into the water like burial. When somebody dies, you don't sprinkle dust on the head and say, you are buried him. When somebody dies, you don't put your finger in the mud and make a sign of the cross on his forehead and say he's buried. If he's buried by baptism, you bury him and you make him lie flat inside the river. You don't make him squat in the river. When you bury somebody, you don't look at the grave and then make him in a sitting position. He lies down. You bury him and submerge him in the dust. So it says, we're buried with Christ. But we don't remain there inside the water forever. We we'll come up. Because Jesus rose from the dead. We're raised, risen with Christ. Romans chapter 7. Reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 7. Reading from verse 4. We have four. My brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ that she should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. After that baptism, and you are raised and you are brought back, we need to see the evidence of a new life. In verse 6, but now we're delivered from the Lord, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. After you are buried and you are raised up, you are now to demonstrate and to show that you have the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 5. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins before salvation, as quickened us together with Christ. Now we've come to Christ. The old man is dead, buried. We come alive and we quickened with Christ. By grace are you saved. Look at this, look at this. And he has raised us up. 
he was buried he rose up and then he says we too he has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 if ye then be risen with Christ crucified with Christ dead with Christ risen with Christ if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God set your affection you are baptized you are buried you are risen with Christ and you live a risen resurrected life seek those things which are above set your affections on things above not things on the earth for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God when Christ who is our life shall appear then shall ye also appear with him in glory amen, amen. now verse 17 there's evidence now you've known the Lord you died with him you were raised up with him and you're not living in newness of life it's not like your past life your former life is still the life you are living cannot be now that you have been crucified with Christ you died with Christ and you are risen with Christ and you are living not in the oldness of the letter in your old life but you live in newness of life look at what follows verse 17 and whatsoever ye do in word or deed you do all now in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God and the Father by him new life what if after water baptism the person still lives in a righteousness in the works of the flesh in the manifestation of the flesh of the old man and is just carrying the title the ticket the certificate of and baptized and baptized and baptized a pastor not an ordinary pastor real real pastor of deeper life baptized me I can take you to the place I can show you the place where I was baptized it was a glorious day but his life is still like it was before he said he knew the Lord what do you make of that Romans chapter 2 Romans chapter 2 verse 25 in Romans chapter 2 verse 25 for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law but if thou be a breaker of the law thy circumcision is made on circumcision for the children of Israel the sin that associated them identified them with Israel as a nation is that they were circumcised the ordinance that identifies us with Christ with the body of Christ with citizenship in the kingdom is this water baptism read that verse 25 with that understanding Romans chapter 2 verse 25 for baptism profiteth verily profiteth if thou keep the law that's the law of Christ now whatsoever ye do in word or deed 
do all things in the name of the Lord. Your baptism verily profiteth if thou keep the watch of God. But if you are a breaker of the law of Christ, the watch of Christ, your baptism is made on baptism. That is, it's reversed. It has no value in the sight of God. We must take that dead old man for burial. Is buried and the old man is forgotten. And we come out now and we live in newness of life. That leads me to the second point, breaking of delicate new minds from old bondages. Breaking of delicate new minds from old bondages. You see, when the old man was still alive, it had a lot of things it was bound to. The sinner has bondages upon his life, upon his spirit. And when he's baptized in water, there is a break from the past. There is a connection with the present and the future. There is a break from Satan. There is a connection with the Savior. There is a break from the world. And there is a connection with the Lord. And let me show you an illustration. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I read from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Verse 2. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. It says, when the children of Israel came out, of Egypt. It was like baptism for them when they passed through the sea, the Red Sea. And then when they passed under the cloud, it was like baptism in the cloud for them. But you know what? Those children of Israel, as they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, they were supposed to be broken from the bondage of Egypt. Exodus chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 3. Exodus chapter 13, and we're reading from verse 3. Breaking of the new minds. These people that have just come to the Lord, breaking them from their old bondages. Exodus chapter 13, verse 3. And Moses said, unto the people remember this day in the in which ye came out of Egypt out of the house of bondage you are broken up from your bondage remember this day that this is what it means you're saved by the application of the blood of the lamb when I see the blood I'll pass over you and now you have come out you have come out of the house of bondage. For by the strength of hands, the Lord brought you out from this place. And there shall no leavened bread be eaten. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, it says, I came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them through the way. Of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. He said he did not lead them. God led them not through the way of the Philistines, the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, look at this, look at this, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war. 
and they returned to Egypt. He didn't want those children of Israel that came out of the bondage to return to the bondage to return to Egypt. Would you notice Numbers chapter 11? Numbers chapter 11, reading from verse 4. Numbers 11, reading from verse 4. And the meek multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. That's exactly what the Lord did not want them to remember. And after the baptism, now in the New Covenant, New Testament, there's something he doesn't want us to remember. The past life. The bondage we were tied to in the world before salvation. That's why the teaching now comes after the water baptism that these delicate new minds who have just come to know the Lord babes in Christ will break them off from the old bondage but there they said we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely the cucumbers the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic but now our soul is dried away there is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes to them the new life was dull to them the new situation was dull to them the comparison between manna Food, the food of angels that were being given to eat is uh, not uh, is not interesting to them. Still, in comparison with the onions and the garlic and the cucumbers of Egypt, that's exactly what the Lord did not want to happen after they were baptized unto Moses in the sea. The same thing you know, as we come to the New Testament. Now, we're baptized in water. And he wants us to totally break off from the old bondage. Number one, the old bondage of the world. The bondage of the world. That's why he says teaching them to observe. Now we come under teaching so that in the mind of the new believer, in the mind of the standing believer, in the mind of the long-standing believer, he is broken off from the bondage of the world. James chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. As we have been baptized in water, we we'll make sure that the bondage of the world doesn't come back. Attraction to the world doesn't come back. Being strapped to the world does not happen again because friendship of the world is enmity with God. James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 27. Pure religion. And undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in the affliction. Look at this, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We break the association, we break the interaction, we break the connection between the new believer and the world. It's bondage. Number two from worldly powers, worldly powers will break 
that bondage worldly powers in whatever form secret cult evil spirit occultism powers old covenant with the evil one is a bondage and as we bring in the new believer he needs to understand now you are connected with christ and the bondage to worldly powers must be broken ephesians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 2 ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience is bondage is bondage and as we're teaching the new converts and teaching the new babes we're not just teaching them teaching them something superficial we break the bondage number one with the world i don't want to talk about that now you want him to remain in bondage I cannot teach him that now. You want him to remain in the bondage of Egypt. You break him from the world. That's the teaching. And then you break him from worldly powers. In Romans, in Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places there are sinners who are being in bondage to all those powers in the sky and all those powers in the forest all those powers in the bush and when they come to christ and they bury the old man the next step is that there is a breaking there is a division there is a tearing off from the old bondage number three the bondage of religion the bondage of religion religion brings bondage you look at some uh, various religion there is the religion on the other side of the fence and it brings bondage it's bondage to the evil one and now as they come to the lord there's still some things they learned in that religion it's in their brain it's their mind it's in their habit it's in their character and what we're teaching them is to look at that old bondage and break this delicate new mind from the old bondage of religion galatians chapter one and i'm reading from verse 14 galatians chapter one we're reading from verse 14 you break the old bondage of the old religion in chapter 1 of galatians verse 14 and profited in the jews religion above many my equals in my own nation i profited in the jewish religion above many there's some people they already they get converted now and the religion might not be the other one on, in the, on the other side of the face. The religion is uh, titled Christian. But it's a Christian that is not rooted in the Bible. And so they have a lot of uh, bondage from that religion. And some of them, either they ring the bell or they beat the drum or they burn the incense or they do whatever, they profit in that religion. But then it says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal the son in me that I might preach him among the heathen immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. He wouldn't remain in the bondage of religion. That's the bondage of superstition and tradition. The bondage of superstition and tradition. And when the people come to the Lord, now they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The traditions are still there. It's locked up in their brain. It's locked up in their mind. I don't eat this because of 
that and I don't go out on this at this time because of that. I observe this day because of that and I'm still a Sabbatarian because of this. They have traditions and it's a bondage. They will not enjoy the freedom of the new life. And after that water baptism, we look at them, we interview them, we understand them and we break them away from the superstition and the tradition. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 and I'm reading from verse 22. Acts chapter 17 verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of mass hill and said ye men of Athens I perceive that in all things, in all things, in their worship, in all things, in their personal lives, in all things, in their marriage, in all things, when they build a new house, in all things, and then when they observe a particular day, in all things, ye are too superstitious. Yeah, too superstitious. There are many people in our land, many people in our nation, many people everywhere. They are too superstitious. And even though they have come to Christ, they repented. They didn't repent of superstition. They repented of, I was stealing, I was still no more. I was gambling, I will gamble no more. I was into adultery, no adultery anymore. I was into fornication, no fornication anymore. Drunkenness, I will not drink like that anymore. But the superstition remains in touch. And it is when they are born again, you see those superstitions will hinder their faith. That superstition will hinder their connection with Christ, will hinder their concept of the new life. And so we break them away from the superstition and from the tradition. I'm looking at Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. Colossians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 8. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, beware. Now it's talking to believers. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. These were believers. And Paul, the apostle, needed to tell them to break them away from traditions of men. And then it says, and not after Christ. There is a bondage of a false prophet. If you were in a for under a false prophet before you were born again, you understand that being under a false prophet is a great bondage. You could not take any decision without the affirmation and the you know the confirmation of the false prophet. If you are going to travel, the false prophet must tell you whether you can or you cannot. If you are going to get a new job, the false prophet will tell you whether you are going to get it or not. If you are going to get married, uh, the prophet will tell you whether that's all right or not. And if you have married already, whether that wife is a good wife or a bad wife, whether she's a witch or she's an ordinary woman, the false prophet will have to tell you. All those sinners, they were in bondage to false prophets. And whatever the false prophet said, that was it and now as they come to Christ and they're baptized in water and they're buried and they rise up again now you're teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you and you break them from the bondage of the false prophet especially if those pro false prophets if they were not just ordinary prophets but they had some kind of power to show to the people and to capture them and to enslave them. Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 11. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 11. 
and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And after those people who have been deceived, after they come to know the Lord as their personal savior, you must teach them to break the connection and the bondage with that false prophet. Look at verse 24, Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's a very great, great bondage. You also deliver them from the bondage of fear. The bondage of fear. Hebrews, I'm reading from chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14 and verse 15. The average man on the street that eventually gives his life to the Lord. He has the bondage of fear. He fears Satan, of course. He fears evil spirits, of course. He fears old men, of course. He fears old women, of course. He fears the wind. If the wind is moving like a little whirlwind, he fears he attaches something to that. If he knocks his foot on his stone and he misses his steps and falls, there's something behind that. He fears that if there is a rat or a cat that is, you know, in the dark and you can see the eyes of the cat but cannot see the black cat, he will not sleep for the rest of the night. He fears something. If there's a cockroach, he fears the cockroach. If he's hearing sound but he cannot see the origin of that sound, the person is behind the curtain or is somewhere, but he's hearing the sound clearly. He believes there's a mystery there. He's afraid of everything. He's afraid of everyone. And it's a great bondage. And the bondage of fear must be broken. It's not just that you're baptized in water. You bury that old man and then you rise again and you are taught to break the bondage of fear. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. The devil is destroyed out of your life. His power is destroyed out of your life. Look at verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. All their lifetime subject to bondage. What are you doing with the new convert? He has bondages, the bondage of the world, the bondage of world powers, the bondage of religion, the bondage of superstition and tradition, the bondage of false prophets, and the bondage of fear. What do you do? You teach him to break the bondage, the covenant that he has with them. Only then with his life be free. There's the bondage of worldly music the bondage of worldly music when people come to the lord there are people that are insane mad with the music of the world if they hear it anytime they'll drop everything they're doing if it's on the street they'll start dancing the, the music of the nightclub the music of the beer parlor and the music that they hear everywhere it turns them on and once that music comes to them it's like idolatry they cannot hear anything anymore and when they listen to the music that has meaning that has words that has doctrine that has the word of god 
to them that is not interesting. It's like the manna that comes from heaven and it cannot tell the taste of that one but the onion and the garlic and the cucumber that comes from Egypt. That's all they recognize. And you must break the bondage of worldly music. We're looking at Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 5. Daniel chapter 3 verse 5 that at that time at what time ye hear the sound of the cornage and the flute and the harp and the sampot and the sanctuary and the dulcimer you understand organ is not only used in the church it's used in the world trumpets are not only used in the church they're used in the world harps are not only used in the church they're used in the world as well and i say we those uh, worldly people they have already conditioned the mind of the people and once they hear it it just takes over everything it teaches them how to live uh, the lyrics of the wordings of the songs in the world teaches them how to live their family family teaches them the way of the world that's how they get the principles of life that worldly music and here it says at what time you hear that sound of the carnage and of the flute and of this of the harp of the sackboard and dulcima and sultry and all kinds of music all kinds of music the people of the world they have all kinds of music there's a kind of music they play that is gentle and flows with the rhythm. There's a kind of music they play that will make you almost sedate you, almost make you hypnotize you. That if, uh, the, uh, if the dentist is operating on you, they're playing that music and the music uh, sedates you. You will not feel the pain. And if you have sorrow, there's a kind of music they play that will take the sorrow away. You don't need Christ. You don't need a prayer you don't need any other thing just their music will do it it says all kinds of music you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar king had set up and then it continues but you see there were people that are broken that bondage that that kind of music does not appeal to them and you need to take a deliberate effort and break the bondage of worldly music from the minds of the people who have just come to Christ. Make them like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Break the bondage of worldly, uh, worldly abomination. Worldly abominations. There are many abominations that go on in the world, and because uh, you know it's uh, regarded as normal, there are people that have taken that as normal, and yet it is abomination in the sight of the Lord. I'm looking at uh, Revelation chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 17, reading from verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple as scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. There are, you know, things like that. In Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable, 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 and murderers and upmongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death verse 27 and there shall in no wise enter into it any sin that defileth neither whatsoever walketh abomination or maketh a lie but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life, you break them off from the world's abomination. And it is a terrible abomination you need to look into. And as you're teaching these people, many people are not free from the doctrines of devils. The doctrines of devils. The doctrines of devils. They say they come to the Lord. After they've come to the Lord, all the doctrines of devils, 
devils have doctrines and some of those doctrines will appear all right will appear acceptable like when jesus appeared in the synagogue they said we know who thou art thou art jesus the son of the most high and yet it was coming from the devil coming from the devil and that uh, woman that lady would speak of divination following after these are the servants of the living god who show unto us who show unto us who show unto us the way of salvation uh -uh. they're not showing evil spirits they're not showing demons the way of salvation there's no salvation for them but they say these are the servants of god who are showing us evil spirits the way of salvation and you have to break them from doctrines of devils doctrines of devils i'm reading from first timothy chapter four and i'm reading from verse one for Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron that's what the lord is telling us we need to get separated from all those things and there is separation from sin partners those sin partners they're strong they're powerful in their bondage they're powerful once you know somebody has taken a decision he's going to follow the lord until the rest of his life and in the absence of the same partner, all is well. In the absence of that same partner, the decision appears firm. But the same partner calls on the phone. Where were you? I looked for you this particular time. I couldn't get you. Did you go to a religious meeting? Are you going to separate from me? She's not even seen the man. And she's already trembling. She cannot talk because there's a terrible bondage of that same partner over the lady. Or maybe it's a man who has taken the decision. What am I hearing? Are you leaving our covenant? You remember? We cut your hand. We cut my hand. We mix the blood together. We put it in water. You drank it, I drank it, and we put a curse on it that if you ever leave me, if I ever leave you, that it will go, everything is turned over at in a single moment. I pray the Lord will deliver you from that bondage in Jesus' name. A greater amen. Proverbs chapter 29, I'm reading from verse 24. Proverbs 29, I'm reading from verse 24. Whoso is partner with a thief, hateth his own soul. Whosoever is a partner to a sinner, hateth his own soul. Whosoever is a partner to a backslider, Hateth a son soul. Whosoever is a partner to a compromiser, hateth a son soul. He heareth cursing and bereath it not, and the fear of man bringeth a snare. Your heart will not be calm when you are fearful. Your heart will not be steadfast when you are fearful. There's palpitation. Once you hear his voice, once you hear a voice, once you see her face to face, and you look at her eyeballs, and you look at his eyeballs, and 
you have not said anything yet but because the bondage is so strong already you're saying i understand i understand don't talk i'm sorry i'm coming back to what we used to do I've, i i made a mistake i went to that side already you are reversing all your conviction because of the fear of man the bondage of the fear of man will be broken away from every life here today in jesus name it says the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. The Lord will keep you, keep me, keep us safe in Jesus' name. Good, good headquarters, amen. Point number three now, finally, building the dedicated new members with the Bible. Building the dedicated new members with the Bible. As we're building them up, as we're making them strong, there's no other book. Were you seeing this book, the Bible? Come to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 20. Teaching them, this after the water baptism, teaching them this after taking them to the river and dipping them immersing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost and now they have come back from that water baptism event now you are teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you all things whatsoever i have commanded you where do you find that that's in the bible in the bible you teach them all things whatsoever i've commanded you and lo i am with you always even to the end of the world and the church said the bible the bible somebody shout out the bible do you have your bible there where's your bible wonderful help me shout wonderful the bible what's the bible b-i-b-l-e boundless instruction building limitless expectations boundless instruction building limitless expectations you see as that new convert baby cries as he comes he has his expectations the expectations he had as a sinner when i grow up i'll be this i'll be this i'll be that he comes to the kingdom of God and he begins to hear the promises of God. If these promises are true, I expect this, I hope this will happen, I hope that will happen. He looks at his life and he looks at the profession he has now and he says, can I start anything new now that I'm serious with life? Now that I've come to Christ, all my past, I never succeeded. I will start this, I will not finish. I will start this, I'll not finish. I'll start that, I'll not finish. Now, I come to Christ. I have expectation now. Things are different. Everything I start, I will finish. You didn't hear that one? Everything you start, you will finish believers have expectations and then you're a believer you just got into school and then you have been thinking you know before i came to christ i used to forget everything i read everything i take on i used to forget but now you're a believer and christ lives on the inside of you and the Holy Ghost will bring unto you the remembrance of everything he has said and everything you have learned. You have expectations beyond your expectations. There are limitless expectations. 
you look at the characters of the bible you look at the people in the bible look at what elijah did that brings up something in your heart and look at what um, elisha did that brought something in your life you look at what isaiah did at what paul the apostle did look at what Moses did from the age of 80 until the end of his life and there you begin to expand your expectation and what will bring those limited, limitless expectations to your life is the instruction in the Bible that is boundless, boundless, boundless. The promise is, in fact, it goes to the point of saying, with God, all things are possible, and then with you as you believe, all things are possible. You make that new convert to see the Bible in a new perspective, in a new light, and to understand this Bible I carry contains boundless instruction, building, or bringing limitless expectations. And this is what we use to build up the new members who are now dedicated unto God. Point number three, building the dedicated new members with the Bible. Look at Matthew again, chapter 28, verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things. How many things? Tell me out aloud. All things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. To the word of his grace to the word of his grace which is able to build you up is the word the bible that is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them all them which are sanctified the word that builds us up second timothy Chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I read from verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's the Bible, boundless instruction, building, limitless expectations is good for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works as we build the new believer and also build your own life what do we build number one the foundation the foundation Many of them have been here and there. There is no foundation, solid foundation to their lives. No foundation, no principles to their lives. There's no foundation, no decision in their lives. And now they come through your preaching to Christ. And now as they have been baptized in water, and you want to teach them to be firm, to be solid, to be steadfast, to be uncompromising, you start with building a foundation. Hebrews chapter 6, I read from verse 1, build the foundation. It says in chapter 6 verse 1, therefore, Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You must lay the foundation, settle the foundation 
before you move on. We're also building their faith. Building their faith. In Romans chapter 10 and in verse 17. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They need faith. They must take the shield of faith wherewith they'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We need to build fellowship. Fellowship. They're not just, you know, isolated believers. They are roaming here and there. But to build fellowship. How do you build the fellowship? Or the word? Or the Bible? In First John chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. First John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. That's how we build them foundation. That's what the word of life, faith, what the word of life, fellowship, what the word of life, for the life was manifested. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was for the Father and was manifested unto us that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, we build fellowship by the word. Verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We need to build a fellowship so that the mindset of I'm all alone by myself. I like a solitary life. I'm going to go to heaven by myself. I believe on Jesus in isolation as an individual. No, no, not at all. Build them into the fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Build freedom. Build freedom. Build freedom. It's been so much attached to slavery. Build freedom. It's been so much attached to a helpless life. I can't help it. That's what it's like the world and Satan, they tied ropes on his legs, on his ankle, and they pull him here and there. It's never enjoyed freedom. But now, as you are building him up, you build the foundation. You build the faith. You build the fellowship. And you build the freedom. In John chapter 8, I'm reading from the statue. John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 30. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, the scripture of truth. That's the Bible. And the truth shall make you free. In the Bible, that builds our freedom. Number five, the family. The family. You see, the family. The new company doesn't know to build the family. It runs to the father-in-law, runs to the mother-in-law. It runs to the mother, runs to the father. It runs to the people that are stargazers. How does he build his family? What's he going to do with his family? He tries to recollect how daddy lived with mommy. How mommy reacted to daddy. That's how he's building his family. And now he comes to the Lord. And as he comes to the Lord, he builds his family on the Bible. Boundless instruction building, you know, limitless expectation. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 3. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? That's what they thought. That's what they learned. That's what their tradition told them. 
That's what they saw in their community. And he said, and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? Go back to the Bible. Have ye not read? Go back to the word of God. Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be, tell me out aloud, one flesh, wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore god has joined together let no man put asunder building them faith and faithfulness with fruitfulness faithfulness and fruitfulness build the consciousness that in small things they have to be faithful and you too teaching them in small things some big things you have to be faithful build that into them you're building the dedicated new members of the word of god or the bible in uh, luke chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 10 luke chapter 16 i'm reading from verse 10 he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much if therefore ye have not been faithful in the righteous mammon in the spending of money who will commit to you the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? And then build them for the future. Build them for the future. Build on a foundation. Build their faith. Build their fellowship, build their freedom, build their family, build faithfulness and fruitfulness, build them to always look at the future. Any action now, I look at it in view of the future. Any words I speak now, I look at those words in line with what will come in the future. Every decision I make now, every place I go now, everyone I befriend now, everything I get away from now, I do all things in line with what will be the consequence in the future. Build them and build yourself with the understanding of what happens to me as a result of this in the future. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, I read from verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 29. Oh, that they were wise that they understood things that they will consider their latter end. They're called to a decision. They don't just jump in decision. They look before they leave. I will consider my latter end. That decision, where will it lead me in the future? They're called to a new friendship. I won't say yes to that yet. Where will that lead me in the future? I'm called to a new kind of action. What will that result into in the future? Somebody is telling me, don't go to deeper life. There's too much of the Bible. There's a, somebody who led deeper life. Who is who has established a church? Come over there. You'll enjoy that one. If I do that, the future what will that mean in the future don't listen to them on marriage go and marry who you want to marry and after all you'll bring him you'll bring her to that church think of the future anything you're doing tell them anything they're planning tell them anything they're deciding tell them anything you're doing or planning or thinking of yourself 
here is the bottom line oh that they were wise that they understood this that they would consider the future their latter age i pray that all these that were made applicable to the new converts were made applicable to every one of our lives in jesus name you'll bury the dead old man i said you'll bury the dead old man any trace of the old man any works of the flesh if they have not been totally buried you have buried something we'll see the leg outside we'll see the hand outside we'll see the head outside now every scene of the old man is buried today in our lives in jesus name and we break off our dedicated minds from old bondages all those old bondages they are broken off today and now you're building your life and building your life and you'll be built a strong edifice and, and, the, and sanctuary for the lord in jesus name and as you build your life and lead your life you always think of the future of your latter end and i pray from now until that final day your life will be a happy life it will be a fulfilling life it will be a life that is built on the word of god in jesus name the bible will become a new book for you boundless instruction building limitless expectation a new day has started for you today where are you why don't you rise up and tell the lord let all this be fulfilled in your life you are no more going to be the same again as you consider as you bring into your life everything that we have learned today and boundless blessings and limitless blessings will all come upon your life and you are going to be stronger greater and higher and the lord fulfill his word in every one of your lives in jesus name